Okay, so I have a, a note here that says the system is, is recording, but the lights don't come on. So it's now time, and so I'm just going to assume that we are, we are recording. Um, the first, uh, but you, we should check that uh, in, uh, maybe later today or tomorrow. Um, today, I, so I want to make sure that we know something about next Monday. It's our second exam. Uh, same, same format as last time. Three, four problems, one of them, one of them from Chapter 4. Um, are there any questions, comments, or worries now that we're getting close to it? Somebody asked me, sorry. What is the aspect that most students trip up on? Uh, so what are the aspect that most people uh, um, trip up on in this exam? I did it myself. And also, what, you know, any, any tips for studying was another question, and I'll, I'll, I can roll those guys in together. Um, I think... Uh, First of all, the, the one nag is to make sure you do your homework. That's, that's really critical. Because you don't want to give away 10 points, a third of your test, on something that you... you and and what, what I mean by do your homework, if I might have been clear, is not to, not to read the solutions. Because that doesn't help you when you're you know, faced with a problem and no, and no solutions. It's not, it's not enough to understand the, the, the solution to the problem because you have to do it. And that's just the nature, that's just the nature of being an engineer. If you think about it, it's, it's, it's not to understand the design, it's to do the design, it's to come up with the design. Much harder, much harder, right? And, that, and, that, and that's what we try to get you to do. So that's one, that's one answer to, to, the, to the, just in terms of, of things. And I, and, I, and I do see, a, a, I usually do see a percentage of people who, geez, that was the only problem I didn't do, you know, comes back to me, you know, to a, week, a week and a half later. Um, the other thing is, you, you should know, you should look back over your other tests and say, okay, um, why did I miss these points? You know, and I think one of the things that you'll, you'll discover, if you haven't already, is that you probably know the material, but you never thought of it that way before. You know, and so, and so when I write a test question, I write it to, to try to see if you really understand as opposed to um, just, or just have, a, have a cursory you know, familiarity with it. My decision, my, my reason for this is, is, is very overt. You have to make decisions with your knowledge. You are working really hard. You're learning a lot of things, a lot of very pertinent, very good things in this course and in all the other courses. But you're going to, be, to make a living and to make a difference, you're going to have to turn that, that, that knowledge into decisions. I will, t I will go this route. I will go AM instead of FM on this problem. Okay, and in order to do that, in order to guide people in what in your logic, you're really going to have to not just know something, but really own it. And so my questions are designed to get you into that thinking. Okay, and so and so again, uh, to translate that down into a tactic. Before you give up on a problem, ask yourself the question: Do I know the answer? About do I know what do I know about this subject? What do I know about this 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 um you know, this question, even if you don't fully understand the, 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 the wording of it. And then maybe, maybe you'll be able to work back and find, and find the match. Okay? So read the problems carefully and, and, try, to, and try to understand why I'm asking a certain, a certain thing in a certain way. Try to understand what I'm asking and why I'm asking it for it in a certain way. The prime example was the way I said, is this system linear time invariant? That was, a, that was a really poor, one, one way to look at that is that was poor phrasing because the, you just had no information. Another way to look at it was that's the kind of knowledge that you have to have when somebody, somebody will ask you that question. You know, if, they're, if you're looking at, if they're, if they're reviewing, your, reviewing your convolution work, they might ask you is, are you, you know, is that a linear time invariant system? And you'll have to say, 
Of course not, but we have to assume it is, you know, for this calculation. Okay? And that's a very valid answer. Okay? So that's an example of a curveball. And, and just to remind you, that was worth all of one point on that, on that last test. So, although... Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions or comments? Great. So today, we'll talk about le uh, Lecture 19. And we're now into Chapter 6. We're done with FN. And, and we're going we're gonna to do postcode modulation. Okay? I know, I know that some of you um, missed last time, and I hope that you got caught up on, um, on uh, e-learning on the Echo Center. But just in case you didn't, let me draw the block diagram for a, for a, uh, a pulse code modulation transport system. And at the transmitter, there are basically three blocks that we're going to take one at a time, basically lecture by lecture by lecture. And the first block is to take an analog signal, a continuous time analog signal, and to sample it. And at the output of this, we will have a, con we will have a discrete time signal. We will know the voltage instead of at every instant of time, at only certain instance of instances of time. Okay? So the output of a, of a when, I when I start with a continuous time system, I'll write M of T because that's, that's our message signal. What we'll have is a discrete time representation of M of T. We could, you could call it a M of N if you wanted to, to show that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, discrete time signal. But it's not digital yet. It's not digital yet. The digitization of that comes in the next box, quantization. And another way to think about that is that's the analog to digital conversion. Okay? Maybe both of these blocks together would be considered formally analog to digital conversion, but, but basically the heart of the A to D process, the heart of the, is the quantization. Okay? And what you're doing there, what you're doing there is you're saying, okay, I have, a, I have any value in my, in my, um, in my let, me, let me, actually, let me just sketch. So I have, a, I have a continuous time signal M of T. I come in and I sample it. And so I get a value, a very precise value, at any instant of time, at certain selected instants of time, okay? And then, to quantize it, we draw some bins. And the way I've drawn these, this value of voltage here becomes any value between here and here. These two values of voltages become a single digital code that represents a value between here and here. These two voltages become, again, indistinguishable and represented by a digital code that is anywhere between here and here. So the digitization process lops off significant digits, or possibly significant digits, or digits that we deem to be insignificant. Maybe that's a more, more pompous way of saying that. Okay? But I've got a stream of voltage numbers, and I say I'm only, th only going to keep three significant digits, and I'm going to label it as one code one digital code. Okay? So I cannot distinguish between this voltage and this voltage, even though I could in my in my sampled signal and I could in my original in my original continuous time signal. Okay? 
Now, I, again, I want to remind you of the value of a digital signal, which is so long as I can differentiate between a zero and a one, I can completely restore my signal to that value, to that digital code. So if it's a five volt system, way, way, way back in the 70s and 80s, we had five volt TTL logic. If it was a five volt signal, even if you were at 3.8 volts, once you went through a gate, you restored, the out, you restored that value to five volts. It was still a one. So you could be sagging by a lot and still, and still unambiguously restore your value to that one. So you can make a perfect copy of an imprecise, imprecisely digitized signal. And I think last time I used the example of uh, a, photocopy of a, photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy getting very blurry and weak with a lot of specs on it so that it was hard to read versus a, the, the printing fresh of a new PDF document. So you're, it's always, it may be flawed, but it's always the same. Okay? It's always fresh and, 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 and new. And that's a huge advantage for the digital world. And that's one of the reasons why, it's one of the reasons why, um, why, we, why, we, why most of our life is digital. Okay? Now, it's also the reason, this, it's also the same reason that, we, that, we, that we, tell you, we talked about last time, which is if we're, if we're sure that a one is a one and a zero is a zero, even with sag and uncertainty, what that means is we can do some very, very complicated manipulations of that signal. We, can pro we, can, we have much, much more processing power. We can do much more things precisely because of that, that restoration um, property. Okay? So yes, we, we, we're, we're familiar with digital signal processing and the magic and the power of all those algorithms. And it's my claim that that comes from that, restor it comes inherently from that restoration process. So you can think about that and, 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 and challenge that in, in your mind a little bit and see if, see if you agree with me. Okay? Well, after the quantization in my pulse code modulated transmit, modulation transmitter, I do what's called encoding. And it's important to notice that at this point I'm digital. At this point I'm sending ones and zeros. I'm representing my signal as maybe a one, 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 zero, one. But then what I do is I send it down the channel. And the channel is a very analog device. It's a, it's a BNC cable. It's a transmission line. It's, it's the output of an antenna. And so instead of a one, I'm sending a waveform that's representative of a one. An electric field signal or a voltage signal or a current stroke or a dot and a dash on a, on a telegraph line. So I'm, I'm sending an, a, an analog representation of a one and a zero. And the matching of the frequency content and the shape of that, of that analog signal to the channel is the job of this encoding. Okay? So, so this is very, very confusing and I, want, and, 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 and I, want, I just want to, I just want to make sure that we're clear on it. Pulse code modulation is a digital communications technique. It's, it's, the, it's the one we're going to look at the most in this class. It's, the digital, it's a digital communication technique. And the way I'm presenting is we start with an analog signal. We get a digital signal and we send the analog representation of that digital signal down the, down the channel. And there's, there's, a, a, there's advantageous ways and disadvantageous ways to do that. Okay, and that's what we'll talk about in a little bit here. Okay? All right. So let's get into, let's get into the first block, which is sampling. And in particular, what we'll do, we'll start with something called natural sampling. And do you remember I promised you to, to, to go through where Nyquist comes from? When we, were, when we were way, way, way back, when we were thinking about the bandwidth of an FM signal? Well, now we're, now we're, now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. We're saying, okay, where does, where does the... Um, where does this Nyquist relationship come from? Hopefully some of you have seen this demonstration before. Okay. But 
if I've got a signal, and forgive me because I'm going to vary my um, my notation just a, just a little bit. Um, this uh, this message signal, I'm going to call W of T. Heck, I mean the way I write my penmanship, it's you can't tell that's a W or an M, right? Sorry, that's a joke, but it's true. <laughs> Um, so W of T is our message signal, or if it's our, it's our analog signal. And that's going to transform to W of F. And that's the natural, that's a natural frequency, F hertz. And again, I'll label my, I'll label my, um, I'll give you, I'll give you the, 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 the information in the frequency domain. And I'll restrict my bandwidth of my, of my W of T signal, my message signal, to a natural bandwidth B measured in hertz. And so B will be the distance between zero and the maximum frequency of the signal. Same, same as we've ever done. Same as we've, as we've always done. Okay? Now, on top of this, I'm going to have a train of pulses and the width of each of these pulses I'm going to label tau and the separation of these pulses I guess I'll do that one the separation of these pulses will be capital T sub S And if you want, this is a rectangular wave switching waveform. And my duty cycle is tau over T sub S. That's the ratio that the pulse is on divided by off. I'm sorry, divided by the total period, TS. So the percentage of time that that's on versus the total repeat repetition time is, is what we call the duty cycle. And we'll label that D. And I'll say that F sub S is equal to 1 over T S. And what I want to know is what's the relationship between that and B, or actually twice B. Okay? And we know that the sampling frequency must be greater than twice B, but that's exactly what I want to show or demonstrate to you today. Okay? So that's the relationship. Is it greater than, less than? equal to, or what, 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 what have we? Okay. Now, I think it's important to uh, this rectangular wave switching waveform. I'll write that down. I'm using my pulse, the, 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 the notation for a pulse waveform there. And so it's a sum of these pulses. It's a sum of these pulses with a counting integer that, inter that, inter that, that, that gives you an, a delay every k t sub s. Okay? Now, I'm not good enough to draw this again, so I'm just going to overlay, and hopefully you can see the different colors. But if this is on and I multiply this guy with this guy, then what I'll have is a waveform that looks like that. During this period, my switching waveform is off. So if I multiply this by this, I'm multiplying zero by this, these values in here. 
And so then it turns on again. And I get that waveform there. I get that tooth there. Similarly, I'll get this guy here. Similarly, I'll get this guy here and so on and so forth. And so what this red signal is here is W sub S of T. And I'll write W S of T is equal to the product of W of T multiplied by S of T. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Just for grins, just for grins, I'm going to talk about, this isn't really a, a, a realization, but I do want to just sort of inspire on how we might do this. Supposing I have a simple switching transistor. Okay, I've drawn it as a BJT today. That would be unheard of. It'd be a fat. But I've drawn it as a PJT. And we know that this gate opens. We know that this, the base opens and closes this transistor. And so if I send a clock signal... Into my, into my base, then the collector to the emitter turns on and off. So if I feed my omega t there and I measure what comes through here across, say, this load resistor, what I'll get is the naturally sampled, the naturally sampled waveform. Okay? Now, you know there's a lot you have to do to make that whole thing work, but that's, that gives you some idea of, of the direction on how you might realize this. And this is uh, sometimes... sometimes referred to as a gating transistor realization. And again, my, my, my intent is not to, to tell you that we've, that's exactly how to realize it's just to inspire you on how you might approach the problem to get that mixing behavior or that multiplication behavior. Okay? Okay. Now, this is the time domain. This is the frequency domain. If I have a product of WT in the switching waveform here in the time domain... What should I put between the W and the S? Very good. It's a convolution in the frequency domain. So Fourier transform each of those, and I get I go from a multiplication to a to a um, to a mod, to a convolution. Okay. Now, do you remember our trick with the Bessel functions, the cosine of a cosine? What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this pulse train and we're going to write it as a Fourier series. This term here, where I have the, the omega s, which is 2 pi over t s, this guy here is going to look like a, like a phase shift. It's, this guy here is going to, is going to talk to the, is going to say where, wherever this, um, every, every pulse is going to be repeated from that, from that guy there. Well, that's a little bit of, an, of a subtle interpretation as yet, but let's just, let's just point out that, okay, let me back up. 
Um, if this is my Fourier, um, if this is my if this is my my time to signal, and I know that this is a pulse that repeats every T S, then I know that it's periodic in in two pi over T S, and so I'll pick my expansion set or my basis set for my Fourier series as e to the j n times omega s times t. Okay, and then the trick is to find c sub n, and the c sub n coefficients come from the shape of the pulses. And so if you remember, one of the examples that I did for Fourier series, I think this was actually even on the test. A single square pulse gave me a sync function, a discrete frequency um, sync fun function a discreetly sampled uh, a sync function in N. And that D, again, is the, is the duty cycle. Okay? So when we were doing our review of Fourier series, I picked examples that we would need to have later on. So if you forget the details of this, of the four, of this Fourier transform, you can go back to Course Echo and your notes and, and get a hold of that. Well, it's, it's, um, this is S of T, and all we're doing is we're, we're representing, um, in fact, let me, this is S of, of T, and this is S of T, so all we're doing is representing our signals S of T as a Fourier series, but what we want to do is we want to know what, we want to know what S of F is, the Fourier transform of that. And so, this guy here is just, are just a set of constants. So if I Fourier transform term by term by term, I still have the same Fourier constants. And now what I get to do is I get to Fourier transform this guy here term by term by term. And we know in our sleep that the Fourier transform of a sinusoid is a delta function. So, the position of that delta function matters. It's going to appear wherever my frequency component is. So at every n omega s, term by term by term, I get a delta function located at the frequency, at a frequency located of n times f sub s. Okay? That's about one of the simplest Fourier transforms you've ever done. Right? Kind of a nice trick. So now... our sampled waveform in the frequency domain is equal to W times F convoluted with these constants C sub N. Remember, you got to think about this term by term by term, right? Times the stream of delta functions in the frequency space. And if you think about that as a complicated convolution, an integral and a sum, then you should relax and think about it as the sum of a lot of simple convolutions. So just term by term by term, I have an integral with, with W of F convoluted with the world's simplest function, which is the delta function. It, the delta function just sifts out that particular frequency component. Okay? So, so, so this is a case where we have a convolution, and ordinarily convolutions are really hard, but we have, we have a delta function which came from the Fourier components, and so it becomes cake. It becomes really, really elegantly, elegantly nice. 
So WS of F is equal to the sum of the, all these weights That's just the sifting property of the delta function. Okay. And one, I will admit that it's tricky to see that in the, in the, in the frequency domain because you're so used to seeing the sifting property in the, in the time domain. But, hey, it's just a variable. It's just, and, and remember we established that you couldn't tell the difference between one of my letters and another? So T and F, F, you know. Two, you know. See, I can look this tremendously well. And so if I now explicitly put in what I have for C sub n, I get that. So this is my sync function. And this guy here is W of F repeated every N F of F sub S. And remember, there's what W of F looks like. Same as it always does. And so supposing my sync function envelope looks like that. So it's slow, gentle roll off. What I'll have minus capital B and B. That will be my first one at, 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 at zero. Zero times FS will give me a W of F right around the origin in the frequency domain. If I now go out to F sub S, that would be N equal to one. Whoops. That would be N equal to one there. I'll have another and if I go back out this way oops, I'll have one at minus F sub S and if I had a big enough piece of paper, I'd have one at 2 F sub S, 3 F sub S, and so on. Okay. Now, we're really only interested in one of these. So we'd have all the same information if I filtered a box around that one, the way I've drawn this. This guy here, this point here, is FS minus B, right? The location of that in the frequency domain is this guy minus the bandwidth B. And I can filter and extract the perfect information of my signal W of F so long as I have a space between that B and this FS minus B. If FS is not fast enough, this guy will slide so that it overlaps. And that would be bad, bad, bad. 
Because then when I filtered it, I'd have some power from my next... I'd, 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 I'd shuffle in power where it wasn't supposed to be. So this requires that B max for a given sampling frequency probably not the best way to think about it, but, but the maximum B for this sampling frequency was where these two guys just touch. So the very maximum B sub S that you can have, the maximum bandwidth of your message signal for a given sampling frequency must, must be FS minus B max. And if I solve this, I get two B max equal to the sampling frequency or I can write that as the sampling frequency must be greater than or equal to, well, let's say greater than twice B and that is called the Nyquist sampling theorem. Okay? So something that you've memorized is a little demonstration that you can do in just a couple of pages of notes. Okay? So it's not magic. It, it, comes, it comes out from some nice, straightforward thinking about what we were trying to do. So let me redraw this. Focusing in on, that, on, on this guy here. If I come in with a low pass filter, if I come in with a simple low pass filter, I get all the information W of F. Now it's greatly attenuated because I have all this power that I'm filtering out. But we're not too worried about that. Or maybe we should be, but we're not. Wasteful but cheap. <laughs> and so if I have WS of F, I'm sorry, WS of T, it's the same signal whether you represent it in the time domain or the frequency domain, right? But if I have WS of T, and I multiply a nice cosine on there and then I to shift my frequency and then I do a nice low pass filter I get an attenuated version of my W of T this is just some constant oh sure sorry okay so that's a that's a, that's a, a D mod Demodulator. The demodulator um, for this. Simple demodulator for this. Okay. Now, we've been talking about natural sampling. I'm talking about natural sampling. And this was our realization to do the natural sampling. If I throw in a cap here for my V out, what I do is I filter it. This provides a, a, a sample. This, this provides a, a place for my charge to go, be stored, and then be dumped back across the resistor. So... So for flat top sampling, 
What will happen is, do you remember I had a, a waveform that kind of looked like this? And so on for my WS of T. Well, what will happen is that charge will build to a maximum and hold. So it's a simple little sample and hold circuit that will um, will keep my uh, keep my samples from having an uncertainty in their amplitude. And in the frequency domain, in the frequency domain, If this is my natural, that's my natural signal, and I have a sync function, roll off, then what will happen is I'll clip the information a little bit on those, on those, um, on those spikes. Okay. So the sync function will round out the, uh, the, the, some of the details. And that's not really a big deal because you can use an equalizer to boost the attenuation. The frequency by frequency attenuation. Because you know what you're doing. Yes, you can make it. You can make it sloped. You can. You can. You you can build another filter that undoes that because you know what it is. Um, so I don't, know, I don't know if you've um, if you've if you've gone to a music event. You you have a or, or sometimes some your, some people stereo has this. You have an equalizer and they, they they divide up your the frequency to bands and they you can apply a separate gain to each one of those channels, each one of those frequency bands. And so if you've got some some frequency dependent attenuation then what you do is you set your gains the inverse of that so that you can you flatten all that out. Okay? So some people have little eight, eight channels like that, eight little slide switches on their stereos. If you go to the Granada Theater and hang up on top, you'll see a big board like that where people are, are playing with it. And I'm amused because it's sometimes common to set the gain equalization exactly as the attenuation frequency goes. You have to think to set it the other way so that you boost the frequencies that you're losing. Okay. Anyway, that's equalization. Okay. So that's our... That's a little bit about the sampling business. A little bit about the sampling business. Now let's go to the second step. A... B, C. Let's go to the second step and talk a little bit about quantization. So this will convert the sample signal to the digital code. And the question is, how long a digital code 
do you want or can you afford? That's the same as how many bits, how many ones and zeros you use to represent a single, vo a single voltage. Okay? A single voltage. And in other terms, how many significant digits do you want to keep? I just say it's the number of bits. You know, it's an 8-bit. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a three bit. It's an eight bit. It's, you know, that's that's simpler, simple. So let's talk about, let's talk a little bit about that. Supposing I have <coughs> how many levels in my A to D. So I have a waveform that goes from minus V to positive V. So I have M of T that goes from minus V to positive V. And I say, how many, how many levels do I want to cover that span? If, it's, if it goes from minus 4 volts to positive 4 volts, and I pick eight levels, then each one of those levels is worth a volt. So I have one significant digit to describe that waveform. Okay. If it goes from minus 0 .5, 0 0.5 volts to positive 0.5 volts, then each one of those eight bins, each one of those eight levels, is worth 125 millivolts. I do my math right. So, a couple significant digits. Okay? Yes, sir? So, like, if you're working for a company and most of your bits um, or signal is from uh, 2 to 4 volts, would you want to have most of your uh, AD levels in that range? So the question is, the question is, uh, observes that I'm going from I'm 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 going from minus volts minus volt min to positive volt max, um, m minus mp to positive mp like we did before, and so but there's plenty of instances where you might go from a different voltage, you know, say a positive volt one to a positive volt two, and and yes, you're absolutely right. Then 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 what you'd want to do is you'd want to line up your range of voltages into your range of a to d. So if your A to D goes, swings both ways from minus to positive, a simple capacitor will, will, will take your, your, your offset, say your only positive signal, your unipolar signal, and bounce it down to the, down to the, to the around the axis. Okay? It's just a DC shift. Alternatively, alternatively if you've got, if you've got a, a double-sided signal and you don't want that, then you have to add up a bias. You have to add in a bias and float it back up. Okay? So and, and, and there's proper ways of doing that and improper ways of doing that. Ways that, that ways that do it by preserving frequency content and ways that do it by, by preserving your noise behavior. But the, really that, that's a shifting. That's a that in a theory class like this, we we say that's just a simple shift. A simple voltage shift up or down. The real issue is how precise do you want to know given given a range of voltages that may be one volt whether it's up here or down here or down here, how many layers do you want in there? How many levels do you want? To what precision do you need to know? And they're not necessarily evenly spaced, right? Let's, let's start. So the question is they're not necessarily evenly spaced, and, and uh, that's exactly true, but let's start by thinking that they are. Okay? And, and let, me, let me say that 
in, in many, many instances, you don't know that you would value certain voltages more than other voltages, right? You don't know, you don't really know where, where if you don't know much about your message signal, if you don't know much about your, your, the signal that you're digitizing, then it would, be, it would be strange to say, I want to sample this range more than this range, okay? Now, it turns out in a voice channel, and we'll talk about this next time, um, that there are, there are statistics that help you, that allow you to play tricks like that. Okay? Good question. You read the book. <laughs> I think. I just heard it somewhere else. Oh, don't, don't admit to that. <laughs> Say, yes, of course. I'm always prepared. You told me we're going to lecture about this. Yeah, okay. All right. Transfer functions. Transfer functions. So... Let's say, that I have M levels, and for an example, I'm going to have N bits, okay? And so for M levels, I'm going to have 2 to the N bits, Two, I'm sorry, if I have n bits, then two to, the, two to the number of bits will be the number of levels. So if I talk about three bits, two to the three will equal eight or eight levels. And I'll write this as n equals three bits. And what I mean by that is for every voltage, every voltage bin that I make, I'm going to put a one or a zero in those in those slots. Okay, I'm going to put a one or a zero in those slots. So I will have zero 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 one zero one zero zero one one, and so on, to get to to allow me to count up to two to the third or eight different distinct possibilities, distinct digital codes that each one I assign to a certain voltage range, okay? The transfer function one year, I, I keep meaning to cut down the number of bits to two to make this, this easier to draw, sorry. The transfer function, as always, is gonna be an input to the output relationship. And I know that for a certain range, let me, let me um, minus six, minus four, minus two, zero, two, four, six, eight, and this guy here is minus eight. Okay, so my input range will go from minus eight to positive eight volts. Two volts per per level, right? Total swing of 16 volts. I've got eight to play with. So I'm gonna say I don't care between one and 1.5. I care between one and three. The difference between one volt and three volts. That is a lot of real estate. But remember, if I wanna do more, I've gotta add another, another time slot here. Okay? Just the way things work out. And this is my output voltage. And eight, let's see, two, four, six, and eight, minus two, minus four, minus six, and minus eight. And so the interesting thing about this is this, this transfer function for a range of voltages here, gives me exactly one value on my output. So, for example, if my input range is anywhere between zero and two, I may see a half volt out, I may see a one volt out. If my range is between zero and minus two, I may see a minus one volt out. 
plus one minus a minus one is a two volt swing. At the zero volts, I have a transition between this bin and this bin. Between two volts and four volts, all those values will give me, say, a three volt. Oops. And between minus two volts and minus four volts, all those values will give me a minus three volts. So you see what we have is the staircase that looks like that. So my input-output relationship is a staircase. If I'm, any, if, my, if I'm going anywhere in between here, I get the same output as, until I cross that boundary, and then I increment a bit, my bit stream, by one. Okay. So this is my transfer function. for my quantization. Okay. Very nonlinear, don't you think? And it's important to note this guy here I'll call a delta and so that's at delta, that's at 2 delta, that's at uh, 3 delta, minus 2, minus delta, and so on. So delta becomes an uncertainty. Delta becomes an uncertainty. My signal can be anywhere between 2 and 4, but I'm always going to report it at 3. So the value here is going to actually be 3 plus or minus a volt, plus or minus a delta over 2. And in that way, delta, that uncertainty, the size of my staircase, delta, that uncertainty, that size of a staircase, becomes a noise. It becomes a source of noise, a digitization noise, a round-off error. It's a round-off error. And so that's, one, that's another way of, of, of saying how many levels... Do you want? How many levels can you get away with? And remember, it's not always right to say, I want more levels. It's not right to say, I want more levels. For example, think about what you're doing here. You're sampling your signal to one volt, to one voltage. You're ascribing a certain number of bits that you have to send down that channel. Those bits have to get out of the encoding and, down and into the channel in the time that this next sample comes in. And remember that spacing is determined by the bandwidth of your signal. So you have no control over that. It's this next sample is going to come when it's going to come. And the speed of the channel is only going to be so much. So do you remember that, do you remember that I Love Lucy skit where, where Lucy and, and, and her friend are, are working in a chocolate factory and the chocolates just keep coming and they can't unload the chocolates fast enough and they start eating them and great hilarity results? Somebody find that on YouTube and, I'll, I'll, and, and, and post it on the, on the, on the, on the forum. But, it's, it's, but, it, but that's what I'm talking about, is if it takes you a certain number of candies, if you think it takes you a certain number of candies to, to represent a bit, and you don't have the bandwidth on the channel, the channel can't support that rate, then you're going to be losing information. And so it's much better to say, okay, I, ha I, I, can, I can get three samples out the door in the time between 
this guy and this guy. So I'm, I'm, I have that means I have eight bit I have eight bit resolution, and I hope that's enough. And if I need more, then not only do I have to go here and put in more electronics than my A to D, but I have to go here and figure out how to transmit data faster in my channel. Okay. So that's 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 the, that's the system perspective associated with with this with this decision that you make. Okay. So you want you want to be you want to spend all the stuff you have, all the bandwidth you have, but no more. Okay. That's so that's one that's that's another point. Okay. Let me. How much time do I have? Oh, good. Okay. Um, so. In this example here, in this example here, I'm going from minus seven, minus five, minus three, minus one, one, three, five, and seven again, right? So those are my bins. Those are my output bins. So I'm going to have seven, five, Three, one, no zero, minus one, minus three, minus five, and minus seven. Those are my possible outputs in, in the analog domain. We've lost the information between a five and a seven. 6.2 doesn't exist. Okay? It's either a five or a seven, depending on where it falls. And I've got three bits to represent that. So... I can maybe ascribe this as a 000, 001, 010, uh, 011, right? That's my next one. I'm just counting. Um, and, then, and then when I cross over this boundary between minus 1 and 1 for my nice bipolar signal, this, this bit here goes to a 1, 00. zero. One zero one 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 zero and one one one, right? That's a very sensible code, right? That's how that's how that's the first way you would think of of, of, of arranging that. So we'll call that common sense. Okay? We'll call that common sense. What one thing that's really nice about that is if I take a look at the boundary between minus one and one, my most significant bit changes. So if I just look at this one bit here, if I just look at this one bit here, I can tell if I'm above the, above the axis or below the axis. Okay? And what's really nice about that is if I have this, this signal that spends half of its time above the axis and half of its time below the axis, then after running a whole lot of stream of bits, of, of levels, I can count up the number of zeros and I can count up the number of ones. And after a long, long, long number of levels, what should I, what should I expect? The, I'd expect the equal numbers of negative values to positive values over time if I've done a good job of AC coupling my signal. And if I don't, what's happened? I either have a DC shift somewhere, but let's supposing I did that. I'm a good analog designer, so I did that okay. What's happening on the channel? You're including a zero in the quanta. I'm including a zero in the quanta. What happens where I'm, 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 I'm sending a zero where I should be sending a one, or I'm sending a one where I should be sending a zero? A phase lag could be. There could be an, an impairment where I lose a bit. I lose I lose part of my signal. You know, I, I, I've dropped I've dropped certain bits. I've dropped certain I've dropped certain sim symbols, and so I don't have that pair. I don't have a parity check. I don't have that error check. I don't have that parity check. My parity check goes bad. And if that's the case with Internet Protocol, what you can do is you can say resend it. This 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 packet got messed up, so I'm just not going to deliver it. And remember, in, with Internet Protocol, you've, you've got multiple paths. 
it's best effort delivery, but you've got multiple paths, and so you know you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get that packet resent to you, echoed somehow through some weird site in Sweden, eventually, if you just hang out and wait a while. So you make a note on your, on your, on your, on your, on your receiving end, I'm missing packet number 17, and when another repetition of packet number 17 comes in, you plop it in. So sometimes if, you, if you're looking at a, at a digital broadcast, you'll see blotches of your, of your signal gone, and that's a packet dropped. Okay? So if you have the time, if you're not free streaming, you can, you can, you can, you can get it the second time around. Very, very crude error checking. Very, very crude error checking. But it's a good one. And it's, it's, it's dirt simple. So that's a good part of this common sense. That's a good part of this common sense. There's a parity bit. It allows me to do error checking. Now, one thing that I'll, I'll throw rocks at it, though. If I move from here to here, I have one transistor that fires differently. The difference between a 0 and 1 is going to be one gate, which is one transistor. So if I go from here to here, this 0 stays the same, this 0 stays the same, this 0 becomes a 1. I've changed the state of exactly one transistor. Change one level, change one transistor. Sounds pretty good to me. That sounds like a, that sounds like a, a good electronics way to go. But now take a look at as, as I go from minus 5 to th minus 3, the next layer, level. Here I have, I'm going up one, one layer, but I'm firing two different transistors. I'm changing the states of two transistors. And then again, I go from, from this guy to here, I'm only changing one transistor. That's good news. When I cross my boundary, I'm changing one, two, all three transistors. So there's something not elegant because you know that your signal is probably going to go smoothly through these levels. If it doesn't go smoothly through these levels, you're probably undersampling. Okay, so it's going to go smoothly through these levels, and you're going to have your 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 circuit design is going to be is going to be clumsy. You relate this all the way back to the architecture of your of your gate structures, your 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 transistors, and so it's going to be a little clumsy. So there's another, there's another way of doing this. We'll call it the gray code. And somebody should check me on whether that's G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y. Not my spelling, but the right spelling. Okay. And we know we like, we know we like um, the parity bit. Or at least I hope I convinced you that we like the parity bit. And now, remember, there's really no magic about having this code for a minus one and this code for a minus three. There's no magic about the counting that you learn with digital. We don't have to do that. All I'm saying is that I've got a one one one, a one one zero, and a one zero zero, a one zero one, a zero one zero, a zero one one, a one one one, a zero zero zero, and a zero zero one. I've got eight different codes, and I can assign them to eight different quantized sampled voltages. And I can be clever about how I do that. So let me just flip a couple of these around. It doesn't make any sense from a counting perspective. Notice I've got the 111 here, I've got the 000 right next to the switch of parity. So these are completely out of order. So thinking about this as a counting mechanism is horrible. But again, if you're thinking about it from a transistor perspective and abstracting your code, this makes a lot of sense because you're flipping one bit here, one bit here, one transistor here, one transistor here, one transistor on this transition, one transistor on this transition, and one transistor on this transition. error checking and elegant transistor architecture. Okay. That's really nice. That's really nice. 
And so then, so gray codes are, are commonly used because of, for that reason. And it's not obvious if you just look at it, but if you think about what, what you're trying to achieve with this, it is obvious. And the very cool thing about this is we, we, we like this with respect to transistor logic, but this way, way, way predates transistor logic. Okay, and so, and so it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of, if I draw a picture of this, I'll start with a circle, and I'll divide it into eight quadrants of angles. Okay? And I'll draw an inner hub, another ring, another ring, and I think I need one more ring. So I'll have I'll have a spindle so I can attach an axis on this piece of metal or cardboard or whatever I'm building mechanically. And this will be my this will be one significant bit. And I will shade these one, two, three, four states. I will then shade these two states and leave these four states blank. And then I'll fill in these guys and fill in these guys. And so what I've drawn from you is a mechanical gear, a mechanical gear with one level, two, one, one bit, two bits, and three bits one bit, two bit, three bit. And the nice thing is if I cut this out of paper or cut this out of metal or stamp it out of metal, it won't fall apart. Because I have, I have a nice continuous stream of metal that hangs together. And so now if I put this on a motor, I can move this back and forth, changing one bit at a time in accordance with the gray code. This guy nudges it out, this guy nudges the inside out, this guy nudges the outside out, and I made a state change. So we think about digital codes as, as something belonging to transistors, but long, long time before, before electronic computers, long time before electric computers, there were mechanical com computers, mechanical ca calculating machines with gears and, and specialized gears like this. And there was a physical reason, structural integrity, for going to gray codes. And I think it's just really cool that when you then go from mechanical to electronic, the same, for the same reason, you like the same codes, except now the architecture is completely different. But it fits the transistor switching better, just like this picture, this gear, fits the mechanical switching better. Okay, so the same kind of digital logic, the same kind of digital representation of 010, 011, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 that's this inside bit, see? No. And then, and then 100, 101, 111, 110. So this, uh, these are all the states. And in fact, that's a really good assignment. We're out of time, but that's a really good assignment for you is to map each of these into a, into a state like that. It's a nice little puzzle, nice little mechanical puzzle for you guys to think about. Okay? All right. So we'll continue down the path of looking at quantization some more. Some of the other issues that come up with this very, very, very important A to D process and then also encoding. I'll see you Wednesday.